Welcome back. All right, this is my my Tron Tron jersey. It's a it's technically Tron two because it's Flynn's arcade, so it's the 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 second Tron movie, Tron Legacy, right? Uh, but I figured entertainment guy, I can wear my Tron jersey. So that did hurt when I smacked the smacked this, but we're just gonna ignore it. So um, I wanted to talk about a documentary that I watched today. I've carved out some time during the day to watch this. On Boogie 2988. Now, I've watched his videos for a long time, and when I was starting out on YouTube, he was one that I was aware of, he had a huge following, and it was before the fall from grace. So when my channel started out, that's 2016. So that is well before uh, the fall from grace that he's gone through. What's interesting is the documentary I watched, which I would recommend, I'm going to say right now, Mike Klum, great job, absolutely fantastic work. Uh, if he wants to hang around with me for nine months, he's going to see things are pretty boring. Um, I'm still in here. I'm still doing hockey videos. How you doing, Mike? But anyways, um, yeah, uh, the documentary is really well done. I cannot recommend it enough. And it looks like he has gained tens of thousands of subscribers since that one live on YouTube. Good. Uh, I like it when hard work like that is respected and when people, you know, treat it like it's uh, it, it, it's it's a big deal. So anyways, uh, I wanted to talk about I had to take some notes while I was watching this, didn't I? It's just, it's how I'm built. And the funny thing is, it was how I was built before I was a YouTuber. I would take notes on things all the time, even though there wasn't going to be a test and nobody was going to ask me what I'd watched. So one thing is, the first thing that stood out to me is that being famous, being internet famous, is not easy if you have mental health issues coming in about self-esteem. Um, if you have a self-esteem issue, if you have certain triggers from your past or your present, Internet fame can be tough. It, it absolutely can. Because now you're out there. You're out there and, and there's criticism, which leads to, and, and all these notes are kind of tied together. He does have, and they were talking about psychological issues, reactive anger, which is when, you know, you get a criticism and you just, you react and you get mad. And it was something that I learned very early on as a YouTuber that, okay, people are going to say stuff. Stuff's going to be out there. You gotta let it go. And so I, I I had to, and I don't think Boogie ever did. Uh, he will search Reddit, he will search Twitter, he will search YouTube even for videos, anything criti critical of him, which is too bad because it, it all that does is it adds to the imposter syndrome. We all have it. Uh, I did not think when I started up my, my YouTube channel back in 2016 as a hockey channel, that I would become one of the main sources of news for people when it came to hockey. That I would have hundreds of thousands of views a week. That I would have, you know, approaching 300,000 subscribers on, on the hockey channel. I never thought any of that would happen. So, of course, there are times that I wake up, I look at my numbers, and I think, how? Why? What, what is this? And it's never, it's never gone to my head. And, and this is something I've discussed on the channel. Is that, um, and, and it's something that I've, I've always kind of said about people too. That there's some people that are, that are great. And then there's people who know they're great and act like they know they're great. And you guys know what I'm talking about. We're like, it's like, maybe tone it down a little bit. So I, I've never, I've never had that where I've, I've, you know, hey, look at me, I'm a, I'm a YouTuber. I will make that joke. I will make that joke. I have never actually said, do you know who I am? It's not a thing. It's never going to be a thing because I think humility is really important because at any point in time, things can change. You never know what tomorrow is going to bring. So imposter syndrome is there, but for me, I just keep the humility as part of it as well. Like, okay, this is what it is. Make sure that when you're reporting on these things that you're being as fair and down the middle as possible. Try to keep your anger out of things. Um, last night there was an incident in the hockey game that I was alarmed at how dangerous it was. And I think some of that came across in the review and I immediately regretted it. Uh, if you watch, you can see the moment in that review where I was like, you shouldn't have reacted. You shouldn't have reacted like that. Um, you should have just kept it in that neutral spot just because, again, you know, dangerous things can happen. And I, I don't like seeing players get hurt. Uh, it is part and parcel of the game. But in that case, I, I felt like there was a line that had been crossed. And I kind of suspected that player safety wasn't probably going to do anything about it. Um, they didn't. Uh, a fine's not doing anything about it. So anyways, uh, that being said, 
Uh, it all leads into, with Boogie, he has the sense of entitlement. He is entitled to beautiful women. Didn't you know? He's a YouTuber. He's really popular. It's just, you're not. You're not. Um, we've been to Vegas many, many times over, and I've never had that sense of entitlement, that sense of I'm a big deal. Uh, when we go to shows, uh, we're always usually in a, a pretty quiet corner of, of a room. I don't know that anybody has any clue who I am, nor do I care, because I'm there to enjoy a show. It is not about me. It is nice not to have things about me. And the idea that, well, because of, of having a certain number of subscribers online, I am entitled to a better looking person. I just, I don't get it. Uh, one wonderful thing about when Yvonne met me was I was broke. Uh, when we met, I, I was living paycheck to paycheck. And she was not uh, financially... Um, it, she, she wasn't in a position either where she could just, you know, fly off and do things and, and have big vacations. That wasn't a thing. One of the reasons why Yvonne and I try to take uh, two trips a year. So we do the one in you know, around spring break, and then we have one during the summer, is because we haven't had that opportunity before. And we feel like we should take that opportunity now. Uh, because we don't know what's going to happen five, ten years down the road. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in this world as crazy as things are. So if we can travel, we're going to. But it's never a sense of, I deserve this. I've, I I own, this is mine. This I, I, I deserve this. So when we go to Disneyland, for me, it's just a sense of wonderment, a sense of, I wish I'd been here as a kid. I wasn't in a financial position to be here as a kid, but I'm here now. And so I can enjoy that. Vegas, same thing. I'm here. I, I get into the hotel room in Vegas, and I just look out the window, and I think, this is a wonderful, wonderful existence I currently have. Where I don't get the feeling with Boogie, he's had that. I don't know that he's had that moment where he just sits and goes, I... The, I'm here. I have, I'm, I'm here. This is insane. How did this happen? There's a sense of entitlement in what he says, kind of like, well, I got that. I deserve it. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, he also feels he's above a real job. So that if, you, if you've seen the documentary, you know the part with the, the interview. Uh, Moist Critical uh, did a video uh, that I watched actually before I watched the documentary and gets into this. And his his feeling of, I don't need a real job. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a new real job for. If I sat down in a room with somebody right now who was in charge of, you know, hiring for, for a set of companies, I would do well. And I, I say that because I interview well. I've, I've had, uh, most of my experiences interview-wise have gone well. There have been the occasions where I'm like, I don't know that that landed, but usually in that case, it might be where I was trying to get an internal promotion and the person interviewing me, I knew didn't really like me. So I'm like, mm, I'm not going to get the job because they're in charge of the hiring. And then surprise, surprise, I wouldn't get it. Be like, oh, I'm sorry you didn't get it. I'm like, yeah, I suspected. But at any rate, the idea that you're above a real job, above the rest of the, the, the plebeians, I, no, no. Um, I'm fortunate uh, if I ended up in a situation where I have to go back to the nine to five and, you know, I have to really, really downscale, then that's what I have to do. And in this case, uh, Boogie should be selling his house. He should be like selling his stuff is, is one thing, but that's only to pay your bills. That's basically the, the, the equivalent to um, using um, payday loan or using uh, a pawn shop where it's it's temporary and I know I used to frequent pawn shops and it always sucked it was always an awful experience to walk in there and think I'm bringing in my stuff you're gonna give me forty dollars I need to pay for groceries for the week so my kids will have food and then on my payday I get to come in and pay you eighty dollars for that same stuff I think this is a bad arrangement right and then with payday loans you get the money and then you owe them way more when you get paid. So personally, I never had a payday loan because I understood how predatory they were. But uh, yeah, I know there's a lot of people that get into that. And I have no judgment against people that get into payday loan problems. But it feels like with, with Boogie, that's what he's doing, where he should be proactive and I have to sell my house. I have to do this, right? Or um, I have to come back up here. He had every chance to fix this. Uh, he did the weight loss. He had every chance to continue with the weight loss. Uh, he had every chance to do something to keep himself in shape. I talk a lot about how I, I treadmill. There's a few reasons for that. One, 
it holds me accountable. It means that I can't just stop because it would be noticeable pretty quickly. Uh, it also is something that I want to make sure I'm telling people so that viewers understand, hey, you know, he he's working and, 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 and maybe it gets them to do something similar or something along those lines. And it can be simple. It can be a nice brisk walk. It can be, you know, just jogging around the block a few times. I use a treadmill, uh, but there's various ways to do it, right? Uh, but yeah, I, so I, I think he had every chance to fix this. And when all the drama's going on that's really helped to cause his channel's downfall, along the way, he just could have said, I'm not going to do this. Gone back to his material, taken out the videos where he is responding to all this criticism in not a very flattering way and just gone about his way. If he had kept his content clean, and by clean I mean, you know, keeping out the whining, keeping out all the complaints about his, his finances and the gloating when he was doing well on the crypto market, if he had kept all that out and not talked about, I love money, I love money, I love money, he would very likely still have a thriving channel. People would still be waiting for his videos. Um, it, it wouldn't have stopped his marriage from falling apart, or maybe it would if he had actually approached things a little bit differently, right? Um, now, it, the, the girlfriend part. You can't really talk about the documentary, though, talking about the girlfriend part. He's 49 and she's 20. So as you get older, there is definitely, as a man, there is a feeling of, okay, so my, my virile days are kind of behind me, and, you know... In, in Boogie's case, and I get it too, as when I was younger, um, rejection was very common. Uh, I didn't have a serious girlfriend until I was in my mid-20s, and then that ended up being a 15-year relationship. So I never really had the partying. I never really had, you know, that, that fun, the fun part. I, I really never had. So I understand when you're 49 and you're dating somebody who's that much younger, that's part of it. So there's the obviously ugly overtone of that and it's something you have to own it's something you have to say yep yeah, this this looks really bad and he does own it he absolutely does own it but <sighs> where does it go is the question you have to ask so one reason why i would never do this beyond the obvious would be would i really want to be in a relationship with somebody who 10 15 20 years later i'm gone right and they're still young and then I've taken their best years, their young years, and unless I have spoiled them and I've treated them fantastic and, and all that fun stuff, I, I just, I don't think that, I don't think it's a good idea. So it's it's something I wouldn't start in that situation. Um, I've, I've often talked to Yvonne about how if I hadn't met her when I did, and then the channel took off, I probably would just would have stayed single. I would have said, no, I'll just stay single. And right now I would, I would have been single. I would have been you know, traveling around to watch games in different locations and, and just staying as single as possible. Because again, uh, it as you get older, you, you just, you have to watch. There's, there's a whole public perception. It, you got to be careful. Uh, the money in, money out thing. This drives me nuts. This is, and, and this is something that I understand. Uh, he's been a YouTuber for 17 years. Um, so he's, he's used to the YouTube money coming in every month, which is great. But the money in, money out, you can't be doing that. You're living beyond your means. And it's something that I don't do. Um, I try to make sure there's enough money in my bank account that if YouTube stopped paying me for two months, I could still pay for things. I could, I would still be okay. And that's, that's important to make sure I have at least that much time, that lead time, before I have to worry about anything, right? And... The money in, money out, it's it's a bad idea. I get the feeling that, and, and again, you pay your, your rent or your mortgage first, you pay your bills second, uh, you make sure you have groceries third, and then you have the fun money. Then you then whatever's left over, you go through and say, I think I want this, I think I want, all right. And then you have to clamp down at some point and say, and that's enough. I know people will look at my collection and say, well, Shannon doesn't do that. He doesn't say, well, that's enough. Um, I absolutely have. There have absolutely been times, even recently, where um, I've been able to buy something and I've thought, I can't justify that right now. I, I cannot justify that right now. There are jerseys that have been released I do not have, and I don't know when I'm getting them. Because right now, uh, there are things we're trying to save for. Right now, there are certain um, 
certain responsibilities we have that have to be fulfilled first. So the money in, money out thing, I don't fall for that. And I think part of it is the 20 plus years of working paycheck to paycheck. And so one thing that we do as well is if we can get stuff on sale, we get stuff on sale and we will wait for that sale. So we're cheap. <laughs> like we're not, we're not, oh, we're going to spend the most and all the exact, all the exorbitant money. No, we're cheap. We still shop like we're poor. We still shop like we do not have any money because that I think is important to making sure that you don't end up in this kind of situation where you're living beyond your means, right? Um, the the $200,000 he has spent on uh, sex workers between, I think it was between 2018 and 2021, they reported that. Uh, that is that is an exorbitant amount of money. It is, it is just, it, I, I cannot fathom what you could do with that money. And, and I understand it's over a four year period, but still, what you could do with it, like, huh, it's just, it's it's so just mind boggling. Uh, and then they show them go to the, the comedy show. Now, this is where I get aggravated because this is Boogie setting himself up and, and then afterwards being, I can't believe we got targeted. So he sits front row at the comedy club next to his girlfriend. She's 20. She weighs about, uh, I, she, she's, she's tiny. We'll just, we'll just put it there. She's very tiny. So she's tiny. He's, he's, he's Steve. He's boogie. He's big guy. Uh, so it looks odd, right? And so if you're sitting front row at a comedy club and there's a comedian up there, he's going to start asking questions. Where do they normally start asking questions? The front row. This is why when we went to tape face in Vegas, I sat near the back. I was like, I don't know if I want to be part of the act. I knew tape face called people up and I was like, I want to stay as quiet and in the back as possible. What if he knows who I am? Like he might want me up there and might oh, look at the, you know, and, and so I, I was like, nope. And so I sat near the back. If you sit at the front, you have a much better chance of becoming part of the act. And of course it, it's shooting fish in a barrel. He's 49. She's 20. She doesn't look 20. He looks much older, much, much, much older than she does. And so there's the obvious jokes there. Comedian's taking him. And he was mad after, like, I don't like how we're, we're ridiculed like that. Then don't sit front row. Just don't, don't sit in the front, sit in the back. Sit in the back. You can still enjoy it. Uh, it's a comedy show, so it doesn't matter what vantage point you have to see the comedian. Don't sit in the front row. But again, sits in the front row. And what was, what was the first thing he said? I have 4 million subscribers. Why? I don't introduce, I don't do that when I meet people. I don't. It, it's so weird. It's like people can talk to me and they're like, well, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. And I sort of shrug it off like it, it's weird. And people will always do the, you're, you do that. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's bizarre. I can't, I don't understand it either. And then you move on. Right. And I don't, I don't say, oh, I have X amount of subscribers. Why? 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 I don't. It's just not. No. So I wouldn't sit at the front row. And I think part of the thing that's shown in this special as well, and I, I wanted to mention this too, because it's easy when you're a YouTuber, you too much time on your hands, too much time to think, too much time to think about everything that's wrong and everything in your life that's backwards and how you know you've been you've been screwed over and things are like it's it's easy to get into that mindset so a job i think would help which he thinks he's above and i think a job would be perfect i think having one day a week where for eight hours he's out of the house he's off at a job doing a, a normal job he could go to a GameStop or wherever and make it work now obviously uh, with a felony charge uh with the way that he presents himself, it's very hard to employ him, uh, as they showed in there. Um, and of course, the fact that he answers everything with, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, which the interviewer called him out on, that he starts with, these are the things I can't do. Y you can't do that. Um, I know when I was looking for a job um, back as, as a teenager, I'm being concerned with when certain shifts were, that if you're picky and choosy about which kind of shifts you're going for, you will not get the job. There are a million other teenagers willing to walk in the door and say, I'll work with whatever I get. I'll work any shift you give me. What do you want? So why in the world would they take me? And again, if his answer would be, well, but I'm, I'm special and I've got 4 million subscribers. In that environment, you're not special. It doesn't matter. So when I'm not in front of the camera, when I'm out in public, 
not special, no big deal. Um, I do not have any special rights that no one else has because who who cares? I've talked about that on this channel that there are people who are famous on Instagram and famous on TikTok. I have no idea who they are. I think millions of followers matter to me. So I always approach it that way too, that yeah, I may have you know, a decent number of subscribers on YouTube, but nobody has, nobody may know who I am and people may not care even if they do. So I think a job would help. He definitely has too much time to sit around and think about how bad things are. Plus, if you're overspending, having too much time to yourself, that's a problem because you get shopping when you've got too much time on your hands. Um, now, he gets paid for his boxing match, right? $10,000. And then he said he spent more than that putting it together. And all I could think was, how? Like, if, if Keemstar was the one that was putting this boxing match together, right? Uh, just to try to get two big guys in the ring to have the biggest boxing match ever, literally the heaviest boxing match ever, fine. But how do you spend over 10000 Like, I mean, you got to pay for your travel, right? You got to have gloves. You got to have boxing shorts. But I, I don't understand how. I don't understand how it would cost over $10,000. i am not going to have a boxing match. You can offer me ten grand. i am going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, in Boogie's case, he had to take it because the guy's going broke. But if you spend more than that, well, where's that money coming from before the boxing match? And why are you spending it? And at some point in time, wouldn't you be calling Keem and saying, look, this is costing me more than you're going to pay me for this match? I don't know that I want to do this. Plus, if there were 400,000 buys and he got $10,000, that's some bad business right there. Because 400,000 buys, that's some good money. And he, he, didn't, he didn't get the amount that, that he should have, I think, for that. Because whether people are paying just to watch him get beat up, look how much Jake and Logan Paul make off people wanting to see them get beat up and waiting to see them get beat up. Um, this is what got me too, is he's talking about being broke. And then he's talking about his video game budget. I had to buy it. I had to buy it. I had to buy it. But all these video games. Now, he's right on one level. He does have to buy it, but he also has to make a certain amount of money to justify it. So coming back to my collection here, when I'm buying jerseys, if it's an old jersey, I try to keep it at $50. If I can get it below 50 bucks, I will. Because a lot of the stuff I have here, I don't wear. A lot of the stuff I have here is for when I do collection, video, collection videos or if I'm doing a review and I'm like, I'd like to wear something fun, a San Jose jersey that I haven't worn in a while, a Tampa Bay jersey that I haven't worn in a while. Because I feel like if somebody clicks on that video and they see me wearing a jersey that they haven't seen on the ice in 20 or 30 years, they might be more likely to stick around. But I have to look at, okay, here's how much this costs compared to how much it makes. So. Another example would be, every week I have the power rankings, I have hockey pucks that I use for my for my power rankings. These pucks are not cheap by my standard. Um, I buy them on eBay, I buy sets of 32. But because the power rankings are consistently my most watched videos, I can justify spending more on the pucks than I would spend for an old jersey because I know those power rankings videos are going to generate the income that will cover it. And that's where you have to look at your, your, your budgeting. I'm going to spend this amount of money on this because I'm going to make that money back. So for instance, with the hockey channel, I will spend the money. With this channel, I really don't. Uh, I haven't been buying the, the geeky jerseys at the same rate that I used to because I, most of the topics I would discuss on this channel, I already have a geeky jersey that works for. And I just look at the pay. I look at how much they cost. Some of them are beautiful jerseys, but I'm like... Okay, that's $130 American, so it's about $200 Canadian. Can I, could I actually make enough videos to make $200 Canadian wearing that jersey? And the answer is usually no. So I don't buy it. I don't need it. I know it's not going to generate a lot of, you know, people saying, oh, wow, look at that. You know, hey, where'd you get that? And sometimes with the geeky jerseys, I'll say, oh, yeah, geeky jerseys. But the I had to buy it for me is limited to the main channel, not this one, because this one does not generate the income to justify it. He is buying video games now at the same level and for the same reasons that he was when his channel was really, really popular, even though his channel is no longer popular. He needs to scale down. I think Boogie would make more money if he was doing gate playthroughs of old games. Going back 20 years, and, and playing through old games and, and 
that kind of thing. I think, based on the fact he's 49, I think that would help as well. Get into all the retro stuff. You're going to pay a lot less or pay nothing. You're already going through something you have in your collection, and then it's profit. Then when that video goes live, you're not saying, I have to make up $70 I spent on that video game. I have to... I have to make up $120 because I got the video game and then I got all the DLC. No, you can just say, I can just put up this video. This is a video game I already have. And, and for all the brand new video games, you've got so many gaming channels on YouTube. It is ridiculous. They're just stacked on top of each other. His channel at this point doesn't generate a lot of interest off the gaming stuff. So why not go retro with it? Why not do the older stuff with it? That's, that's my opinion anyways. You guys can let me know what you think. But I, I think that can work. Now, the way this ends out is weird. And it feels like it's an incomplete documentary for this. But I guess that's where your end point is. Maybe there wasn't going to be any kind of positive ending. So they were like, this is kind of positive. Um, so, psychedelics. He goes out in the middle of the desert and tries psychedelics. And I saw that and I thought, man, under a starry night sky, some psychedelics. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm going to be a little, little cagey at this point. They work. For me personally, I know they don't work for everybody. They absolutely can work. Um, about, I would say about a year ago, going through some some stuff myself and some stress issues, and I, I tried it one night where I was like, all right, I'll try a little bit of, of, of psychedelic, and it, it, it worked. It, it just, all these parts of my brain that are normally very discon disconnected and disjointed, I had epiphanies. I had, I had a couple of major epiphanies about my own existence, my own life, understanding some things about my life from a perspective of like from when I was three, from a perspective of when I was five, from a, like, I just, it was like everything just flashed and flashed before my eyes in that moment. And it, it, it worked. It, it took away a lot of the negative stuff that was just in there, right? That I, I'd had a hard time shaking for a long, long time. And I just felt at peace. I felt connected to everything. And it was it was a good moment. Now, the, the funny thing is that they don't necessarily work for everybody, but it can work for him. And I, I, I really think it can. But he's never going to get back to what he was. That's the first thing. So he has to not spend money like he did. He has to understand he has to scale things down and not just blow through money. He has to have that budget. I think having somebody budget the money for him is a good idea. Having somebody that says, you know what? You're not buying that because you can't afford it. That's important. But at any rate, that's what I took from this documentary. I think it was very well done. Um, basically, it's just point the microphone at, at Steve and let him talk. And he did. And I don't think he helped his own case at all. But if you've watched the documentary, let me know what you thought in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. Somebody's out mowing the lawn. Is that... Anyways, here you go. Thank you guys so much for all your support. And I, I mean it. I really, really appreciate um, all of the support I've had the whole way through. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of red flags throughout Boogie's rise and fall. And hopefully at some point he turns it around. But I think at this stage, things are so poisoned against him, it would really have to be a full reset for him to have any hope. But let me know your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.